And now we want to move on to section 9.1, which begins a much larger world, mathematically speaking. We're really going to step into inference now in chapter 9. So let's remind ourselves of a couple of things. Um, when you survey um, news organizations, research organizations, um, institutions in general, they're able to turn sample data into predictions about the entire population. But since they only sample and do not speak to everyone, that means that they cannot claim to know the exact population values. What do they do instead when making claims? Well, there's a little bit to unpack there, so let's think about this just a little bit. So they don't speak to everyone. They cannot make a claim about the exact population values. That's section 1.5. It's having to do with sampling error. Let me label it real quick. Okay, so I've highlighted in pink here. So they can't, they don't speak to everyone, so they cannot claim to know the exact population value. What we're describing there is something called sampling error, which we learned about in section 1.5. It's saying that, look, a sample is never a perfect representation of the population. So because by virtue of the fact that it's a sample, by virtue of the fact that it's small, it can never be exactly representative of the population. So we instead think, okay, well, I'll take my sample values and I'll build an interval. Um, so build a window, window slash interval from sample values um, where we think that the population value will fall within. There we go. Um, just to clean that up, we build a window slash interval from our sample values, and then we think that the population value, whatever that is, will fall within that window that we built. If you recall from back in chapter three, what we're saying is that, look, we think that the population value is close to the sample value, but we don't know how close. Let me give you an example. There we go. So my two examples would be that I think X bar should be close to mu. My sample mean and my population mean should be close. Oh, I have this backwards. So mu should be close to X bar. Sorry. One second. There. So mu, which is my population value, should be close to my X bar, but I don't know how close. And then P, by the same token, should be close to my P hat. So my population value should be close to my sample value. Now the word should is actually my called something called my confidence level and the word close is something called my confidence interval and we're going to keep coming back to this idea over and over and over that your sample and population values should be close to each other you just don't know how close and the close part is what confidence intervals are all about and then you're going to build them based off of how confident you want to be and that's called your confidence level okay so let's look at the second case a little bit more fine finally for the rest of this section. So the second one of these is the one we're really going to be looking at in this particular section. Namely, we're interested in building an interval around our population proportion. Although the population mean ones are coming, they're going to be in section 9.2. All right, so the way to build an interval is basically you take a point estimate and you add and subtract away something called your margin of error. And hopefully you've heard that word before, margin of error. It's just going to be your give or your take from your point estimate. All right, so let's look at this. In February of 2014, the Pew Research Center released the results of interviews conducted earlier that year among a randomly selected national sample of 10,013 adults, 18 years of age or older, living in all of the 50 United States and the District of Columbia. During this interview, respondents were asked a variety of questions about social and political topics. The results stated that 39% of all Americans are opposed to same-sex marriage, and then it said in the results, plus or minus 2.6% at a 95% level of confidence. Okay, so the population, it's a little bit hard to dissect, but it's kind of in here because of the sample. So the sample, let me highlight that for you in yellow. That's your sample. Let me describe it down here. It was um, a random group of, let me type this up one second. There we go. It was a random group of adults, 18 or older, living in all 50 states and the DC, District of Columbia. So that would be the sample. Let me type that up one quick. All right, I want to make sure I answer both questions. So it asks to describe the sample. So I've described the sample right here. It's the randoms group of 18 um, adults, 18 or older. And then why is it important that the sample was, quote, random, end quote? Because it has it right up in there that it's randomly selected right there, randomly selected group. So why is that a big deal? Well, it ensures that 
the sample is not biased, right? Remember, we always want a random unbiased sample. Okay, so in describing that sample, that'll help us figure out what the population is. The population is the larger group of this. So if this is your sample, which is a random group of adults living in the US and DC, the population would be the same thing, except it's all adults. 18 or older living in all 50 states and the and District of Columbia. That would be your population, right? Because that's what this is a sample of. Now your sample size was 10,013. What gets students confused sometimes is they'll think 10,013 is the sample and it's just the sample size. The sample itself is this group of people that you want to describe. And then the symbol for sample size is n, little n, right? Lowercase n. All right, what percent of their sample was opposed to same-sex marriage? Well, okay, it was right here. That's 39%. That's actually your statistic, right? It's p hat. So let me type that in. And there we have it, 0 0.39 to 39%. All right, now this little bit is a calculation. So we need to calculate how many people in the sample were opposed to same-sex marriage. So let me show you that. All right, in chapter um, 8.2, section 8.2, we learned that p hat is equal to x over n. But we just said in the problem above that p hat was equal to 0.39. So that's equal to x over n, but n we just said was 10,013. So to find x, you just need to multiply both sides by that 10,013. If you do it over here on the right-hand side, these will end up dividing away to nothing, right? They'll cancel. So you do it over here. And that means that you also have to do it over on the other side, right? So you have to multiply this side over here by 0 0.13, or 10 point, I'm so sorry, 10,013. There we go. All right, so we need to grab a calculator. Let me go grab it. There, I have a calculator. I'm going to type 10,013 times 0 0.39, and I get about 3,905. So there we go. X is approximately 3,905. It's just a little bit of a calculation there to make. And there it fits right there. So you use your p hat formula from check section 8.2, you substitute in p hat, which is 0 0.39, and then the 10,013 for n, and then you solved it for x. All right, for the next part, I'm kind of doing a whole bunch at once, and I did it with um, a by hand drawing. So let me see if I can explain all of this. So what you do is when you make your interval, you're making um, a low end and a high end. You're making a window where you think the true proportion is going to fall. So where the true proportion of um, all Americans who are opposed to same-sex marriage is going to be. So what you do is you take your point estimate and your point estimate, remember, is in the center of your interval because of this formula right here. So you take your point estimate and you add and subtract away your margin of error. So I took my point estimate, which we said was 0.39. That's the center. Then I add on the margin of error, which was 0 0.026, and subtract it away. Now, where did the 0 0.026 come from? Well, let me scroll back up here. See this right here? This right there is your margin of error, right? So it's telling you your margin of error is 2.6% and your p hat is 0.39%, or excuse me, 0.39 or 39%. So let me just say this right here error equals 2.6%. It was given in the problem. Okay. So you take your error, you add it on. So I made it into a decimal. Decimals are way more useful to us at this point than percentages mo most of the time. So I made a decimal and I took 0 0.39, 0 0.39, and I add on 0 0.026. So make them both decimals, and then I take 0 0.39 minus 0 0.026. It's a little bit like the give or take for standard deviation, but there's a bit more going on here for that. But it's essentially a give and a take. Okay, so that's where those two numbers came from, and I showed the calculations. The point estimate is in the center. Okay, 
So the confidence interval itself is, let's see, interval is the two numbers that we find. And that's why I wrote up here, confidence interval is this whole big thing. It's the entire region from 0.364 to 0.416. Done, that's the confidence interval. Or if you like, you can make them both under percentages, 36.4% and 41.6%. Either way, it's fine. Sometimes the one on the right is more useful for interpretation value. Now the point estimate was the center, and that's p hat, which was equal to 0 0.39 or 39%, whichever way you want to think of it. Okay. There it is, 0.39 or 39%. And that point estimate, remember, was in the exact center of that interval. right? So it's right here, it's in blue. It's that blue line right in the middle of the interval, the center line of your window, if you will. Now the error I've labeled in kind of green, it's this distance from the edges to that center, or this is from this edge to the center. Or you could think of it as, hey, you know, if I took this big pink region from 0.416 to 0.364 and I cut it in half, I would know what the error is. So it's half the width. All right, so that error will be the distance from the edges to the center, right? It'll be how far away those far bars are, that 0.416 is from the center, or 0.364 from the center. But because it's a distance, it's always positive, no matter what. Error is always a positive number. You just add or subtract it away. Now, the width of the interval is actually 0 0.052. Let me prove it to you. The width is the high number, 0.416, minus the lowest number, which is 0.364. And when you subtract those two, you're going to get 0.052. There we go. Now that might look a little bit familiar, and that's because there's a relationship going on here. The width is the entire pink zone that I've kind of, it's kind of hard to see, but it's a highlighted pink right in there. So that pink zone, and then the error is the green part, but there's two errors to make up the width. So let me write that up. So two times the error makes the width. There we go, two times the error makes the width, or in other words, half the width. There we go, half the width is equal to your error. Now let me prove it to you in our example. In our example, the width was 0 0.052. You can see it right here, there's the width. Right there. Okay, so the width is 0 0.052. But what's the error? The error was 0 0.026. So take two times, two times 0 0.026, and what do you have? Two times 0 0.026, lo and behold, you have 0 0.052. Or if, in other words, if you take one half times 0 0.052, you're going to get 0 0.026, right? So either way you want to think about it, it's 0 0.052. Um, we tend to use this one on the right more often. Um, not that the other one's wrong, it's just that's the one we use more often. So in our example, it was 2 times 0 0.0526, 2 times 0 0.026 is 0 0.052. Or you could think of it as um, a half of 0 0.052 is equal to 0 0.026, which is the error. Right? Okay, so keep in mind what this means. There's a relationship going on here between width and error that's kind of important, right? Which is that they're directly relationships, right? When one gets bigger, the other gets bigger. It's direct relationship being something we learned about in chapter four. So if you have a larger error, right? If you let your error double, triple, whatever, make it bigger, then two times it will also be bigger and the width will get larger, right? So the larger your error, the larger your width of your interval. The smaller the error, the smaller the width of your interval. Right? They go hand in hand. There's a direct relationship. Okay, let me put it right here. Direct relationship. This means there's a direct relationship between your error and your width. When one goes up, the other goes up as well. When one goes down, the other goes down.